Good morning to everybody. I, uh, my name is Daniel Gianola from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I would like to thank uh, Professor Hallerman for the kind invitation. Regrettably, I have not been able to join you in person. So um, for the sake of time, I will proceed uh, right away. Um, I'm going to deal ex uh, specifically with a brief history of genetic improvement of uh, complex traits in agriculture, uh, with a focus on statistical methodology, which has been my main area of work. And for complex traits, I mean like uh, milk yield and dairy cows, uh, yearling weight in beef cattle, mastitis resistance, susceptibility, or tick load in subtropical and tropical areas. Um, we speak about complex traits because uh, they are the result of a huge number of biochemical reactions that interact with the environment. So uh, therefore, the, our history has been essentially one to use uh, mathematical statistical abstractions in which we measure something that we call the phenotype, Y, and we express the sum function of genetic G and environmental E variables. And of course, uh, mathematically, there is a huge number of functions and uh, animal breeders um, and plant breeders also have used mostly uh, what are called linear models, such as the one in the bottom, phenotype equal to genotype plus environment. And, uh, and that assumes that there are no joint effects between genotypes and environment, which of course we know is not true. Uh, host and cattle do not survive in the tropics, and ndama cattle do not survive in tropical, in temperate areas because they are not productive enough. So that's an extreme example of genotype and environment interaction. And these are quite common in plant breeding and they must be accommodated somehow. Um, <clears throat> before Mendelian laws were established, um, an important contribution was that of Sir Francis Galton, who discovered uh, an association between the average height of parents and the average height of children. And he noted that uh, Parent, children of very tall parents were on average smaller than the parents, and children from very short parents were on average taller than their parents. And he, he called that phenomenon uh, regression to the mean, which uh, of course was immediately related to Gauss and Legendre's least squares. So that gave an impetus for the use of linear models in genetic improvement, as we will see later on. Uh, the three founding fathers of animal breeding as a science were Sewell Wright, who introduced many concepts such as the coefficient of consanguinity or in breeding and the equilibrium distribution of gene frequencies in populations. In the middle, R.A. Fisher, the founding father of modern statistics, and to the right, uh, Jonathan Holden, a, a brilliant British mathematician that was a sexual political activist. But all these ideas that were developed in the early 20th century needed to be put in the context of animal agriculture. And the person that did this was Jay Lash. Uh, Jay Lash uh, was born in Iowa and got his PhD at Wisconsin, and then uh, moved to uh, Iowa State, where he founded a very influential group in animal breeding. It's still a, quite an influential group. Um, I would like to spend a minute uh, on this paper published by Fisher in 1918. Uh, Fisher was about 20, 21 years old. He was an undergraduate. The paper was rejected because the reviewers did not find that there was anything interesting there. And in that paper, he was introducing no less than the analysis of variance and uh, the partition of genetic sources of variability. And in essence, what Fisher did was under some assumptions that are a bit technical. He represented the total variance in a population as the sum of variance components. And we call these, those from a genetic perspective, additive or dominance, mm -hmm. and epistasis, where it involves interactions between genes and environmental. And selection exploits mostly additive variance, and additive variance for most traits is between one to 40%. Uh, lowly heritable traits are notoriously those related to the reproductive complex. 
Now, <clears throat> more recently, uh, actually many, many, many more years after, uh, it became clear on theoretical and empirical grounds that most of the variance that is generated in a population is of the additive nature, which is really good news because it, it tells us that selection should work, and we know it works. Now, Another important development, which was actually the basis for, for what we call multiple trait analysis, which is done routinely in cattle and sheep improvement, is the notion of uh, associations between traits. And Hazel, in 1943, introduced the idea of genetic correlation, which is a metric that measures association at the genetic level to distinguish between the environmental correlation which is uh, what measures association at the environmental level. And sometimes the genetic correlation can be negative and the environmental correlation can be positive and the phenotypic correlation, which is the correlation between observables, uh, turns to be or positive or negative. So observed correlations do not necessarily give a guidance to the genetic basis of association between traits. The bottom gives an expression to relate the three types of correlation, phenotypic in the left, genetic, RG, and environmental, and also the coefficient of uh, heritability of the two traits, X and Y. Now, I'm sorry for the, this, pan, this uh, slide is in Spanish, but I will explain. Uh, this is the central uh, theorem of genetic improvement, so to speak. So in any animal and plant improvement program, we have to define what is merit. What do we want to do? Do we want to breed for sturdier animals, for more resilient animals, for more productive animals, for healthier animals? And we have to assign an economic value to this. And this essentially is a parascientific problem. Um, the, the idea of defining merit is really uh, context dependent. And what we deal with as scientists to try to estimate merit in the best possible manner. And once you define the merit, we have to define the direction of the population. Are you going to select for extremes? Are you going to select for intermediates? Or are you going to try to move the population towards some value that is considered optimal? And there is an expression that appears in basic tests that the expected genetic change per unit of time is proportional to the intensity of selection. For example, with artificial insemination, we can select much more intensely. The correlation between the estimated merit and the merit, which is largely a statistical or computer-based exercise, and the amount of genetic variance present in the population at a given time. And also to express on a unit of time basis, we have to divide by the generation interval. And quite often we wish to put some side constraints such as put constraint on inbreeding, on environmental concerns, on conservation. So in essence, this is a problem for optimization subject to constraints. Sometimes the constraints are sharp, sometimes they're fuzzy, uh, sometimes the merit function may be nonlinear. So uh, we know that it's an optimization problem and that essentially is a solved scientific problem. So defining breeding objectives is by far the most important aspect in a breeding program, but it's one for which we have scientific solutions. Now, um, it makes difference uh, to how efficient your programs are. Here we have a hypothetical comparison between four breeding programs that move at different rates. Uh, the red rate may have been representative of what some develop, uh, well, developing developed countries in, in animal agriculture, such as Argentina, Uruguay, or Brazil, were maybe 20 years ago moving extremely slowly. Even 0.5% per year at that time was considered to be hard to attain. And observe that after 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, it's amazing how the populations differentiate from each other. So uh, genetic improvement is a very powerful source of uh, moving a population towards some desired values. Now, we have essentially three different paradigms. Uh, one is uh, trying to find the segments of the genome that are associated between markers 
and we used to call that quantitative trade loci. Then came the term from uh, human medicine, genome-wide association analysis. And some of you, at least many, I suppose, have seen what I call the, the Manhattan plots, in which uh, given a battery of whole genome markers, you scan side by side, do a simple analysis of association, establish a p-value, uh, some evidence of support for rejection of the null. And then, of course, since you do so many tests, if you have 100,000 markers, you do 100,000 tests, you are found to to find significance just by chance. So you have to correct for multiple uh, tests. And this is uh, one of the zillions of examples of genome-wide association studies applied to uh, thromboembolism is a, uh, is a uh, blood clotting disease in humans. Now, the second paradigm is actually uh, based on Fisher's model and was uh, developed and extended by Professor Charles Henderson. Henderson had studied with Lush at Iowa State, but uh, he founded the famous Cornell School of Animal Breeding. It was extremely influential in the 70s until Henderson uh, passed away. And I had the honor of uh, co-teaching a course with him in 1987 at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, where we were colleagues for uh, three or four years before he passed away. So Henderson's contribution, he was really a, a visionary. He anticipated what is called the large P small M problems, where we have many, many, many more breeding values to estimate than data points. Uh, he introduced what is called the mixed effects linear model, where the breeding values are treated as random variables and develop a powerful algorithm called the mixed model equations and BLAP, the best linear bias predictor that has become the golden standard, the gold standard in genetic evaluation of farm animals, even though there have been many refinements thereafter. And it has many, many properties uh, such as those listed here, but I will not stop on them. I just want you to be aware that it's a very well-established statistical procedure. Um, to do BLAP, uh, various components were needed, so there was a lot of work in the 60s, 70s, and 90s to develop good estimates of various components, and I would like to single out Professor Robin Thompson from Edinburgh, who introduced uh, likelihood-based methods in animal breeding and notoriously a method called REML, residual maximum likelihood. Now, as, uh, because I was uh, an active uh, participant, I'd like to point out that uh, in genetics today, uh, Bayesian methods dominate. And this was due to that uh, a re <clears throat> a revision of statistical foundations in the 50s and the 60s. And uh, I was extremely influenced by some of the writings of Professor George Box. And together with my colleague, he was actually my PhD student, Rohan Fernando, at the time at Illinois, we wrote a paper in 1986 that is considered to be a foundational paper in Bayesian methods in quantitative genetics. Uh, sorry about the commercial. Now, in the meantime, uh, we did not know the genes. We still do not know. And Professor Falconer kept reminding us of the genes in his textbooks. And Alan Robertson was working on what happens when um, a mutant appears in a population, what is the probability of fixation? That's the formula on the top. And in the bottom, uh, Professor Bill Hill, the Robertson and Bill Hill were both from Edinburgh and I had a chance to meet him and I was a personal friend of Bill and Bill unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Two giants, truly, so was Faulkner. But then of course came the genomic era and we could start touching essentially at genomic regions. The mapping projects became successful, the human project, the cattle project, the maize project, and that allowed us to discovery of variants all over the genome, notoriously what I call the MPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And those uh, markers uh, became useful to, to either do genome-wide association studies or to incorporate in what today are called prediction machines. And we will deal with that subsequently. So in 2001, there was a paper by Mewis and Hayes and Goddard introducing the idea of uh, using whole markers 
to predict complex traits. And unfortunately, uh, my friends, Miguel Perez and Ciso and Miguel Toro from Spain and I came two years later. So the, all the credit should go to Mewisen, Hayes and Goddard for introducing what is called genomic selection. So in genomic selection, in essence, we have DNA markers, we uh, have a population, <clears throat> we uh, uh, build the prediction equations from a random sample or from a selected sample of the population. And then we have some selection candidates, we genotype them and choose those with the best prediction. And uh, there are essentially two impacts of genomic selection. One is to reduce the generation interval. And the second one is to increase somewhat the precision of estimation of genetic merit. So here we have a classical dairy cattle progeny testing program. The generation interval is 63 months. It takes about five years for the sons of a bull uh, to be tested and to become active in artificial insemination. With genomic selection, the interval is reduced essentially by a factor of three. So now we can move the populations much faster because we can predict juveniles without indulging into the excessive cost of classical project testing. So a genomic selection has been embraced uh, in most species in animal production, plants, trees, and uh, this gives you an idea of how fast the U.S. Holstein population is a Holstein is a breed of dairy cattle. <clears throat> Advent of molecular markers in the early then, uh, instead of using best linear bias prediction, the methods change to something called genomic best linear bias predictions, and the blue lines are estimated genomic trends to the left, from top to bottom. Milk yield, fat yield, protein yield. Note how the trends accelerated dramatically since genomic selection was introduced in about 2007. And to the right, we have a somatic cell count in dairy cattle, the lower the better, so trends in the right direction. Productive lifespan, the larger the better, going in the right direction. And reproductive rate, which was a very difficult trait to improve and things are moving in the right direction. And this is largely because selection objectives, breeding objectives have changed in the direction of breeding more uh, functional animals that reproduce better, resist diseases better and have a more durable life. And more recently, uh, we have started addressing what is called the machine learning, artificial intelligence paradigm, where instead of using a theory-based model, which we actually we do not have a very good theory for complex traits, uh, we <clears throat> employ uh, methods that are largely non-parametric. And there are essentially two classes of method that are everybody speaks about. This is called the neural network and the most advanced version called the deep neural network. And the second class of methods are based on similarities, based on kernels, notoriously reproducing kernel Hilbert space as regression. And there here we have some examples of uh, these kernel methods, such as BLAP is a kernel method, Krieging, spatial analysis, and then you can form uh, more complicated kernels for more complicated problems. As a second commercial, I'll tell you that our group in Wisconsin was the first one starting in machine learning in quantitative genetics in 2006. Um, these methods are flexible and they can be uh, used to problems where you have multiple sources of omics as well as environmental covariates, which you can incorporate, in, for example, crop models, or you can use as well epigenetic information. So for example, in the right, uh, there is a paper on prediction of height in the plant Arabidopsis, for which there is no theory whatsoever. But the kernel methods work reasonably well. Now, another important and active field today is to use sensors, robots, machines, uh, drones, et cetera, 
to do what is called fine phenotyping. And this is uh, very, very common in plant breeding and it's increasingly active in, uh, in animal breeding, including behavioral traits where the uh, motions and behaviors of animals are monitored on a real-time basis and then incorporated into models of some sort. Um, we have all seen <clears throat> the pandemic uh, where for the first time we were able to follow the evolution of a virus in real time. We saw how some uh, parts of the genome were mutated, how the different strains uh, displace each other, and how regrettably how poorly Africa, Asia, and South America have been able to genotype individuals, actually to probe individuals and to study the viral sequences simply because of lack of resources. So this is evolutional work. If, if you have doubts about the theory of evolution, they should dispel it. Give it mutation and time and things change and give it a huge amount of time and then you observe what the fossil record tells us and what DNA tells us. So this is, uh, I think there are lessons to be extracted from this pandemic that uh, carry on to animal and plant agriculture. <clears throat> uh, we are all concerned about environmental change. I think uh, uh, it's difficult to dispute that there is no environmental change. Yes, we are undergoing severe environmental change. There is a strong evidence that it's anthropogenic and therefore as humans, we are forced to act. So uh, all this is impinging into agriculture because uh, quite often the environmental arguments have been used to constrain the development of animal agriculture programs in developing nations, such as uh, those that produce beef cattle. <clears throat> uh, we all know that oil wells are uh, the main sort of methane production, but yet uh, cattle has become uh, one of the expiatory goats. And many books have been written to this effect and a big discussion going on. So we have to use uh, what we know in order to make our production systems uh, less friendlier from an environmental perspective. Um, also, there is an increasing amount of interest in uh, altering the rumen microbiota. It's really not a new problem, except that now we have genomics and metagenomic uh, profiles. And uh, this is a paper uh, from the group of Oscar Gonzalez Recio in Spain, where they studied genetic variation of the rumen microbiota. Of course, it's difficult to do. Um, you cannot do, do this with many animals, many animals, so the estimates are necessarily imprecise. But this it gives us an idea of what can be done. Um, <clears throat> the next step probably, in, and it's already happening in plant breeding, is to use um, editing of, uh, we have to find out what we should repair, what should we fix, and that's by no means an easy task, especially for um, complex genetic systems that are richly interacting and have minor effects. Uh, but this is something that is happening and we will see more coming in the future. There are also <clears throat> important possibilities that we can learn from the plant world, where we can use plants such as cannabis uh, or pomegranate to develop, to develop medically relevant products that uh, eventually go into randomized trials and uh, show or do not show to be effective for humankind. But this is something that perhaps in animals we should start thinking about it. I'm sure this has been already thought through. And finally, <clears throat> from the perspective of, of uh, is the question of genetic conservation. And, and I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you here a, a personal perspective. I have not worked in this topic uh, from a scientific point of view. Uh, genetic conservation programs exist since I was a kid and that was a lot of decades ago. But let me tell you about something. Uh, I'm from Uruguay originally and my, uh, my parents kept everything that my grandparents case just in, in case they could be useful. And my grandparents kept everything that my great grandparents had just in case they were useful. And what we're dealing today is that on top of what we have from parents and grandparents and, and what we get these days, we have an inordinate amount of junk. 
So we should be extremely careful. The question of a genetic conservation for sake of it, just because it could be useful in the future, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work. I know that as some colleagues that I'm skeptical about this approach and say, well, we should conserve what is useful. But uh, the, the, the definition of what is useful or how long it is useful is a difficult one. Uh, but I'd like to close by saying, yes, there is an important field of conservation genetics that I think uh, it should be revisited from a modern genomic perspective and use whatever technology there is to ascertain that we keep whatever is needed and that has a chance of being useful in the future. I'd like to follow with a couple of remarks and I will get done. Um, the first one, let me go back again to the question of definition of a bringing objective. Uh, today is not easy to define a bringing objective because we have all these buzzwords that everybody uses and that very few can define precisely, such as brittleness, fragility, robustness, resilience, sustainability, activity, sociability, inclusiveness, uh, epi you know, interactome, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we still have to improve production, reproduction, and health and use pedigrees as much as we can and genomic information. So it's not easy to formulate bringing objectives in today's time and nobody has a crystal ball. <laughs> and finally, and this is perhaps uh, an important thing that we, we often overlook is that uh, this will reveal how old fashioned uh, I am. Um, when I was a student, uh, a PhD student, the, you would start by building foundations, then you would think, dream, and come up with a thesis. And, uh, and there was no pressure to write a scientific paper or to get it from a grant, etc. cetera. Uh, but there was time to be thoughtful, independent, and creative. Things have changed. This py learning environment has been inverted. So now the PhD students uh, are accepted into a program they see an advisor and the advisor tells them, uh, in year one, you have to write paper one about this. In year two, you have to write paper two about this. Paper three, and then once you are done, if you have time, build foundations. So most people don't have to take a postdoctoral or several postdoctorals, and then the system self-reproduces itself, producing an incredible amount of literature that is not, not all uniformly useful. So, um, Today in particular, we see beginning students are using complicated methodology without understanding what it is, without knowing enough biology, experimental design, causality, logic, and statistical science. And basic science is fundamental. Without basic science, there is no innovation. You cannot tell a person go and innovate unless the person understands the problem and knows where to go in order to solve it from let's say an interdisciplinary perspective. And the same applies to being objective. So you cannot let geneticists define being objective. That's a program that today, it transcends the fields, it transcends animal agriculture, it transcends societies in many respects. We need more interdisciplinary work to do things properly. And uh, we have these fabulous tools from artificial inter intelligence, but uh, it, it's not going to generate for fertile products if compartments do not intersect. We have to be intelligent in order to use artificial, artificial intelligence. On that note, I will finish here. I don't. I did not time my presentation. I hope I didn't go over time. So, Professor Hallerman, thank you very much. The floor of yours, and thank you, everybody.